I never lie, but I think a lot more people should lie. You could look cool. Yeah, uh, I don't think more people should lie because as somebody who used to lie, it's uh, it's really exhausting. What did you um, lie about? Yeah. I feel like I can rule the world. I know I could be what I want to. Uh, I put my all in it like no days off. On the road, let's travel, never looking back. All right, I, uh, I want to talk about this open sea thing. I'm laughing about it. But before we get into, <laughs> into that, people like story stuff. Let me quote, not, not a story, but do you know who Laird Hamilton is? Surfer? Yeah. So he, uh, he like, is like, when you think of the word like surfer hunk, he's like the guy you like think of, right? Like, blonde right. he's like kind of the most famous one, I think. And he's a little bit older now, right? Yeah. He's in his fifties. He could be as old as 60, but, uh, he's 57. And there's two amazing things about him. The first, he has this thing called Laird superfood. Have you heard of that? No. Okay. It's interesting for a bunch of reasons. The first reason why it's interesting is Laird is interesting to me. He's basically... So Laird Hamilton was a surfer in Hawaii. He had a troubled childhood, but he dedicated his life to surfing. He says that he might be a little autistic and that he like focuses on a goal incredibly... Uh, like he, he'll, he'll achieve it no matter what, and he obsesses. So for a long time, he was obsessed with finding the biggest wave. He invented toe in surfing. And then eventually he got into uh, health and he got obsessed with eliminating sugar, eliminating flour, and just being very, very, very healthy. And so eventually he launched a company called Laird Superfood. And he's obsessed with coffee. He drinks tons of caffeine, loves coffee. And he didn't want to use like almond milk or oatly or anything like that. And so he invents this thing called Laird Superfood. It starts with a creamer. Now they sell a bunch of different stuff, a bunch of different creamers, a bunch of different health foods. Hmm. It seems legitimate. I'm going to buy some of them, some of it because uh, it does look, I like him. And I like the idea of what it promises, although I don't know the science behind it. But the second second reason why why it's interesting, it went public. It's publicly traded. It went public with like eighteen million in revenue. Currently has a market cap of one hundred sixty three million dollars. Revenue of like fifty, I think. Uh, but kind of cool, right? And Laird interests me because he's kind of like there's no such thing as a perfect human, but he checks all the boxes in terms of he's doing pretty good in a bunch of stuff. So physically fit, great. He seems emotionally incredibly healthy, very stable. Like when he talks to him, he seems very wise and like he uh, understands uh, how to treat people. He's got a great family, it seems. And now financially very successful, adventurous. This guy's my hero. Uh, but I didn't know if you had ever heard. I thought it was interesting that they, they took the company public. Yeah, that sounds also just... Did they take it public in the US or somewhere else? Here. It's uh, where, it's on it's on the New York Stock, Stock Exchange. It's called Laird Superfood. Doesn't it seem too small? It's like a penny stock. Like, what is the market cap of it? At, if it has eighteen million in revenue, it doesn't have eighteen million in revenue now. Maybe what's it have now? You can look it up. Like forty or fifty. It had its market cap right now is one hundred and sixty three. Its highest ever was uh, two times that. Interesting. Okay, uh, and yeah, I'm kind of like you, where there's some, you know, some. Um, like, if you're just like a normal Instagram influencer and you're like hawking some product. Uh, or whoever you're, whoever you're me, you're you're just like normal person, and you're you're hawking some product. It's like okay, you know, you probably tried to do a good job with this, but like this is a business for you, and you're doing this for the business. And then when you see someone like Laird Hamilton, who's like walked the walk for like I don't know how many years, this guy's like fifty something years old, and you see he's just like ripped, absolutely ripped at that age. You kind of know that he's lived a certain lifestyle, and. Um, I have a higher level of trust when this guy's selling me a tea or a, you know, a breakfast waffle, keto breakfast waffles or a creamer or whatever the, the stuff is that he has. I do feel like I trust it a lot more than, uh, you know, whatever, Ryan Gosling's gin or something, you right. know, like where it's like clearly just celebrity pl- face plus generic product equals like branded product. Now, the second thing I wanted to ask you, okay, so... When I look at this guy, I've been reading a lot about him. I've been obsessing a little bit about him, and I've been watching all this stuff. He is always working out. And for the past maybe four months, I've been working out really hard. I'll do like maybe 10 workouts a week, so sometimes two days, and I'm always Whoa. sweating. Yeah, I'm moving a lot. And I started thinking about this because there's this thing that Trump said, and it's always stuck with me. And, and for some <laughs> reason, the way that he said it, I just it never went away. And someone was like, this is right after his physical. And they go, Trump, why don't you exercise? He's like, it's a waste of time. I don't want to waste my energy. And they're like, what? He goes, yeah, look, 
Like I only have a limited amount of energy in my lifetime. My 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 body is like a battery. I'm not going to use my battery on exercise when I could be using it building businesses or doing whatever. And I have no idea what the truth is of this, but it got me thinking. <laughs> Did you really <laughs> say this? Did this yeah, guy yeah, really yeah. say this? <laughs> I paraphrase it, but yeah. So if you Google like Trump health battery, they battery. call it. They call it like it's like Trump's battery theory, or something like that. And I have no idea the validity of this. This could be the stupidest thing ever. I've I don't know. I, I'm it just. I just thought it was hilarious when he said it, but it got me thinking. Like, I read David Goggins' biography, and like the dude's sweating all the time, and like can <laughs> like. Do all right, you hey, let, let me read this out. Let me read this out. Uh, Trump gave up athletics after college because he believed that the human body was like a battery with a finite amount of energy, which exercise only depleted. <laughs> he said, uh, what did he say? He goes, oh, no, here, here's a scientist. Um, a better analogy would be it's like a fire that you continue to fuel with more coal or wood. You need to continue to add fuel or your flame will die. This is true whether you exercise it or not. Simply by existing, we're burning energy. Okay, I don't know what this guy's talking about. So, but- well, I, I was thinking about it. I'm like, <laughs> If our if our life only Dude, if our heart can like, all- hold on this, this Trump battery thing is too ridiculous I can't get over it and also it's great right that you it's great as like you know a possible val- this is like I walked in on my sister once she was supposed to be studying and she was uh, I walked into her room and she was just laying down sleeping and I was like oh wait, wake up like you're supposed to be my mom like I was a little kid my mom had sent me in to be like is she studying for the test I was like mom said you're supposed to be studying for the test she's like no no, no I'm reviewing in my head. And I was like, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And I went back to my mom and I was like, she's reviewing. She just closed her eyes to review. Oh, my God. And like God. she was definitely just sleeping. That's what Trump's battery thing is to me. <laughs> it's like some bullshit excuse for not wanting to exercise. Yeah, well, I, I was thinking, I'm like, well, again, I'm an idiot. I know nothing. But like if your heart can only beat some number of beats throughout your lifetime, am I wasting it by just like being sweaty all the time and working out all the time? And I, uh, <laughs> I was thinking about this Laird Hamilton guy and I'm like, Dude, maybe you should just go for walks instead of like, like how much exercise like do we actually need? You know, like when I see David Goggins like running hundreds of miles and he's like on his Instagram, he's always working out. It's like, I, I just, I, w- I want to start reading about like where, where's the threshold of where it actually doesn't matter. Cause yeah, well, okay. I, I think, you know, here's my, my very basic theory, which is it's not like a, Okay, it's like a battery, but batteries can be recharged and whatnot. Uh, it's basically right. Your heart and other parts of your body are muscles, and the muscles can grow stronger with you know exercise, and then they develop, or they can grow weaker without use. And so, not using them doesn't just preserve your precious energy marbles, and you're going to go live till you're 200. It's uh, it's that if you build your muscles up, including your heart, your brain, by you know studying or cardiovascular exercise. You're going to get more out of it. You're going to be able to do more now. Plus, it'll be able to like last longer through atrophy in your life. I hear uh, you, so, but but when so. I see Laird Hamilton at 57, and I'm like working my butt off right now, I'm like, he he. All of his stuff is about recovery. He talks about recovery. He talks about how this right. helps. And I'm like, well, just like do less and you don't, don't need you, don't, you don't need to recover. <laughs> <laughs> just like do less stuff, you know. Like, just- like okay, look at Laird Hamilton and then look at Trump and just look at their results and say, which body do you ultimately want? Do you want that guy's body and energy, or do you want this guy's body and energy? And I think it'll guide you down the right path. Like, I'm just saying, I'm thinking out loud here. This is something that I'm questioning <laughs> myself. Like, how hard am I going to go? And like, why do I want to recover all the time? Like, I just, I, I there's there should be no need to recover all the time. Um, do you want to, do you want to, before we get into topics, do you want to, do you want to talk about this, uh, NFT thing or no? So I just finished up my crypto week, which was, I I talked about it last pod. Basically I took a week of time, canceled all my other meetings. I said, I'm going to go into, I'm going to go neck deep in crypto. What does that mean? All these ideas I knew about, but I basically, I wanted to go play with, I wanted to go do right. So if you think about like how you can participate in things, you can sit on the sidelines and watch. You can kind of uh, you, you can kind of jump in and be a, a player, but not the not the driver. You can participate, or you can create, and that's when you're really hands on. You're actually making shit happen. So I wanted to create as much as possible this week. I had already been on the sidelines watching. I'd already been a participant. There's a whole bunch of protocols and tools and ideas that I'd never done. So, anyways, I had this idea, and tell me what you think. So I think we should create an NFT, and I, you know, side note, I created it. It's ready to go. If I just push this button, um, push it. Okay, push it. Okay, great. So I created this NFT called Five Minutes of Fame. And what it is, it's a one-of-one token. 
that anybody can own that gives you the right to five minutes of airtime on our show now or any time in the future. You can hold this thing for five years. If you think we're going to be massive, big, much bigger in five years, just hold it. It'll, it'll appreciate. But once you use it, and the way to use it is you burn it, right? So you own this token and it's only one of one. And when you want to use it, you send it to our wallet. And that when you send it to our wallet, we've received it. That tells us this token has been burned. And the five minutes of fame, now you can come on the show and you can hang with us, talk with us, and you can do whatever you want. If you want to just repeat the name of your company for five straight minutes, annoying, but doable. You can do it to promote your shit that way. If you want to come brainstorm with us or you want to come <laughs> ask questions, you can, you can do whatever you want as long as it's obviously not like, you know, vulgar or hateful or whatever. Not some like uncool shit, you know, like can, do can they can they sell it? They can sell it. Yeah. So, so somebody. So I've started the floor price at 0.5 ETH, right? So less than one Ether. I want to see how high this ends up going. So I'm going to start the bidding there. It's going to run for one week after this episode airs. And when it's going to run for one week, and it, so anybody can go on OpenSea right now, and I got to figure out how you find it. It's called Five Minutes of Fame, My First Million. And um, but, but you, uh, you, you got to make it, I'll tweet it out too. You got to spell My First Million. It's just MFM now. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'll, I'm gonna change the title of it. I'm also gonna put it in the show notes of this description. So you go to OpenSea. If you don't know how to do NFTs and OpenSea, uh, there's a hard way to start. But if you kind of know what this stuff's all about, you know what we're doing here. What we're doing is we're basically saying, look, money has always been like a uh, a frozen block of time, right? I go do a bunch of work. So I, I put in time, I get money. I go give that money to a restaurant. I say, hey, thaw this frozen block of time out and uh, you go work for a bit. You you go you go spend some time for me, make some food for me. And then, you know, like that's how money trades hands. It's just frozen blocks of time. So what I did was I just took five minutes of air time and I froze it. And I said, anybody can buy this. You can hold it, you can use it, or you can sell it, you can flip it. And I want to see what happens with this thing over time. And I want to see if who buys it. I want to see what they do with it. I want to see if they use it or if they wait because our show is growing like 20% month over month, 25% month over month. So, you know, you wait a year and all of a sudden you're going to have – it's a bigger show. It's a big, it's a, it's more valuable airtime for you to go on. And by the way, we don't take sponsors anymore, right? We sold the show to HubSpot. They're the only sponsors. So if you wanted to come sponsor a show and buy some airtime, you literally couldn't right now. You couldn't. This is the only way. And so I, this is an experiment. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm excited about it. It was one of my things is make and mint an NFT of my own. That was part of my crypto week. All right, great. I'm, I'll share it. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to wait for you to tweet it and then I'll I'll take lead on how you write it. And then I'll Okay, I'll sounds well. good. All right, let's see what happens. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, what what do we want to do? Let's do this. Let's do this in order. So, let's let's first do another story. Let's do this guy who took our Stripe for Vice idea, which was a long time ago. So he's. He I don't know if I buy story. it. I don't know if I buy it. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll we'll preface it with this. Might be total bullshit, right? Sounds a little made up. Sounds a little bit fan fictiony, but uh, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. So, okay. So, so we said this idea. I don't even know how long ago, maybe a year ago, which was uh, uh, my friend, uh, our, our, our mutual friend, Suli, had this idea and I, I, I brought it to the podcast, which was uh, Stripe for Vice vice Ventures, right? So what does that mean? So Stripe is a pro uh, payment processing uh, platform. So if you want to take payments on your website, you use Stripe. But the problem is Stripe has, like many payment processors, like PayPal, like others, terms and conditions, which basically say you can't use this if you're cannabis, if you're crypto, if you're, um, you know, porn, if you're all these different use cases. And so um, the idea was to build a product, you know, clone the product quality and, and developer friendliness of Stripe, but have your terms and conditions open. And this is like kind of a, a strategic move because one of the best ways to con compete against the big monopolies is not to do what they're not doing now, right? A lot of people do this. They pitch us an idea that says, oh, you know, you know, Twitch isn't focused on this right now, music. So we're going to do Twitch for music. It's like, yeah, but you know, they could if they wanted to, yeah. especially if you proved it out, they could do that. Or, oh, Facebook doesn't have, you know, doesn't let you see this. So I'm going to add this feature. Okay, but they could easily add that. Whereas, um, the, whereas these are, they can't do it because it would go against, it would threaten their core business. So Stripe can't, Stripe might even, the, the, the CEO might say, hey, I think cannabis is great. But he can't do it because it's going to threaten his relationships with his banking partners. And so it'll put the core, big, valuable business at risk, which is why you're actually safe going and pursuing this because they're just not going to do it in the same way that um, 
like OnlyFans is safe because it's something Instagram will never do. Instagram could have all those same models on there, but they will never release this feature, which lets you pay for kind of this locked, locked, uh, not safe for content because it threatens their advertising business with their clean, with Coca-Cola and whoever else. And so terms and conditions is actually an amazing way to compete against big successful incumbents go do what they explicitly say they won't do um and they can't do so okay anyways there's this guy on twitter the name is skyler mr skyler is his his handle and he says public service announcement for all the my first million pod fans from stealing ideas from the pod don't play short-term games because take it from me i took their stripe for vice idea i grew it to a business doing over four hundred thousand dollars a month in 60 days in less than 60 days and then I got pushed out by literal gangsters. I wish I was joking. Here's the story. Anyway, so he tells the story. He basically says he looked at Stripe's terms of service and it said um, you can't do get-rich-quick schemes. You can't do cannabis. You can't do uh, a mugshot publication or pay-to-remove websites. So he's like, great. That's my prospecting list. I will just make a list of these companies that do exactly those things and I'll start cold emailing like crazy. And he's like, and then in parallel, I went, I went to Galileo and Synapse, and I tried to find payment providers, infrastructure companies that would let me do this. They both said no. So then I called some like new fintech companies. They also said no. He's like, but then I went and I found this small like Canadian bank that I had used in the past, uh, like a local bank. And it turns out for a monthly fee, they'll work with it. They'll work with me. Great. And so then he sets it up and he starts getting like online dispensaries. Cannabis companies start using them. And this is where it gets a little bit weird. Like that business is working, but one of the dispensary companies, I guess, like that he knew that was super profitable, like they needed help. And he's like, oh, they asked me to come on board and blah, blah. I didn't really understand this part. Did you get this? He like basically no, joins their company. Yeah. Uh, he joins their company or something like that. And um, anyways, it starts making $400,000 a month. And he's like, you know, <laughs> I moved into a dope condo in Vancouver, down in Vancouver. I fly first class to Turks and Caicos. I spent $13,000 a night at this hotel. And, you know, <laughs> he goes, the girl I'm seeing is now running around with a fake set of, a new set of fake titties somewhere. I wish I had saved this money, but instead I was spending it, right? And then he's like, <laughs> so this is where this part of the story sounded a little unbelievable because I don't think you would even be balling out that much on this small, this, this little amount of money. But I guess I some agree. people just don't, don't save. So maybe. Anyways, he um, he says, you know, the company that they were buying product from, which is like a publicly listed company, is run by crooked gangsters. They started harassing me and my family, blah, blah, blah. I ended up paying them, I don't know, bag. I, I met up with them with a bag of cash and I told them to leave my family alone and I, I left the business forever. And, uh, you know, that's my story of, you know, I, I, I've traded peace of mind. I, I traded my money for, for peace of not peace of mind. And here's what I think subscribe to my newsletter. <laughs> I, so I'm, I'm go- I Googled this guy a bunch. Uh, he, I think he's full of it. This is just maybe, I, I think that maybe there's like some truth here. Like maybe he tried to start this, maybe like someone sketchy emailed him and that's about it. <laughs> yeah it definitely seems like the bag of cash i met them in a park and they told me uh are you lying bro are you yeah. lying is this is this you lying i think you're lying so i don't know i don't know if he's lying or not he needs to show some receipts if he wants us to uh, to fully vouch for it but i thought it's an entertaining story nonetheless I, I think that actually like more people should lie to be honest i don't know why more people don't lie whenever i'm on the internet and i'm like talking about stuff anonymously i always tell the truth like, Dude, like what, what a great zag. Everybody else is all about honesty. You know what? Lying. Underrated. I never lie a lot. Like, I'll comment, like, in different posts, and they'll say, like, like just ridiculous stuff. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, I've done this before. Like, here, like, just, like, on a random Fox News thread or, or on Reddit. I'm like, no, that's not true for this reason and that reason. And I'll explain my personal experience. I never lie. But I think a lot more people should lie. You could look cool. Yeah, uh, I don't think more people should lie because as somebody who used to lie, it's uh, it's really exhausting. What did you um, lie about? Dude, I used to like – I used to exaggerate. So, you know, I used to do everything that I wouldn't call a lie. But if you look back, it's a lie, right? Like I would exaggerate or somebody thinks something and I like let it run. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to correct that. I'm going to let you run with this mistaken assumption. I didn't lie. You got it wrong and I didn't, fi- I didn't correct you. That's not my fault. And so there was all these little things like that or – I don't know. Like it was just be where it was always 
like insecurity. So it's like, you know, if I wanted to seem cooler, smarter, richer, more successful than I was, I was willing to kind of like embellish or lead somebody on in the wrong way or, or whatever. And, um, and maybe I still do it sometimes. I don't really know. I, I don't want to say like I've completely gotten rid of it. But I can't remember the last time I did that. But I definitely remember a point in time about five years ago where I was like, I'm just not going to lie anymore. I'm just going to actually say what the situation is and then I'm going to let the chips fall where they may. And it was so freeing and re- uh, relief. It was like just relief because um, somebody said this once. They, were, they go they, – like in programming, there's this thing where like anytime an application slows down, one of the one of the reasons that people will say if you talk to programmers, they're like, oh, you know, it's like a threading problem or like there's a multi-thread problem. And what it means is basically there's like multiple processes running at once and they start to like use up all the memory of the computer. And basically that's what happens in your head when you lie is your brain has to keep two threads open. There's the thread that basically is like what I said and then there's the truth and you constantly have to keep track of what you said versus the truth in order to like maintain the lie. And so that becomes like a, having two processes running in your head just drains you of energy is what I found. So I don't lie anymore. But I think you're right that in the short term, there's a big benefit to lying, um, which is like, you know, like most people can't figure it out. Most people don't don't check you. Even the people who do check you just like their voice is like small compared to the most people that that will just take it at fake value. Right. Like fake well, news, I think, is popular for a reason. Like I've done stuff like I bought I bought my car. So I bought my car. It was a it was over it was six figures and I bought it. I saw a picture of it online and it was like three hours away. And I called the guy and I go, hey, what's up? Uh, you got this car? I go, I go, great. I'll send you the money right now. Will you drive it over in a few days? And I just why it was all done on my cell phone in the car. I just wired him the money and he brought it to me days later. And I've done that so many times. Motorcycles, vehicles. I buy shit all the time. And I'll just say like, yeah, I'll just give you the money now. Don't sell it. And so many people are honest. And I'm and in my head, I'm like, everything would be so much more profitable, but way worse. If like you can get away with lying. You can you can totally get away with it. And most people never do it. And it does shock me. Uh, all right. And we'll end that segment there. Um, all right, um, let's go. Let's do another one. Uh, you want to do an idea? I got some ideas. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this idea, this comes from Ben. So Ben gave me this idea today. And I like I'm gonna, it. We I'm, I'm about- going to I'm going to burn you hard on this one. So keep going. OK, good, good. Um, figs for construction. OK, so for those who don't know what figs is, figs is a, a brand that came out that basically was making like cooler looking scrubs, medical scrubs. So the stuff that doctors and nurses wear, those little blue outfits that were like kind of traditionally like, well, it's all blue, the same color of blue. and They're all kind of baggy and they're all kind of look shitty. And here you have these people that are like working really hard. They wear this stuff all day. Uh, it's kind of like their identity. It's like their uniform. And um, and they make good money. You know, doctors make good money. And yeah, you know, why are they wearing this stuff? And so figs came out. I think it started with nurses. And they just started making like better fitting. So it didn't look as baggy and loose. A little more flattering. And they had some different colors and patterns that you could have uh, for your scrubs. And we, so we, we fig- talked about them right – I think right when they got going. Yeah, like pretty early on we talked about them. And fast forward now. A couple, this, we're two years into the pod. Um Things is a public company now. Wow, it's worth they went seven public? billion dollars. What? Seven billion dollar market cap. What? If you go read any of the articles, it's like why Figs is the next Lululemon, why it's the next Nike, why Figs is is a Starbucks for scrubs. It's How like they just put the every sexy brand. Figs is several years old. I think Figs is like probably eight years old or something. Uh, Figs founded. Let's see. And the woman who started it does not look like the woman who would start. She, I mean, she looks like a like a like a fashion like a supermodel. Oh, really? Okay, that's like cool. I would have thought. So, like, I guess a nurse in my head. Like, she's wearing like fancy ass shit in her pictures. So, so Figs is yeah, I think I got it right. Eight years old. Uh, it went public at four billion. It's now seven billion, and um, and I think what what is it? So, so there's this guy Thomas Tull who I didn't know, but he's the founder of Legendary Pictures. He had sold that to a Chinese company for three and a half billion dollars, and uh, and he was the majority shareholder. And so I think he owned fifty eight percent of Figs at the time of IPO, which is oh kind of God. a ludicrous amount of a public company to own. And then uh, you know, is this the person you're talking about, Heather Heather Hassan? Yeah, you see, like in yeah. a lot of her photos, she looks like she's like I was like, uh, she just looks like a like a she's in what's the equivalent of GQ for women? I don't know, I'm an idiot. But you know what I mean? <laughs> Vogue. Like she's wearing Vogue. I don't know. She's wearing, she just look, does, I would just imagine someone wearing a nurse's outfit. 
And he put 50 million in in 2018 and became a majority owner. So 2018 is when he, he puts 50 million and become, buys you know, 58%. Three years later, goes public at a $4.4 billion valuation. So his 50 million turned into 2.2 million of, of, of equity value. So, so good on him. Um, okay. So anyways, so basically the, uh, okay. So the idea here, so figs, Seven billion dollar market cap. I think it does just over a quarter billion dollars, so over two hundred fifty million dollars of revenue a year. I couldn't find the exact number quickly during my last minute research here, but here's the idea: figs for construction. So, how many other industries have a large workforce that kind of needs specialty um, clothing for doing what they do? And today they have like a generic default, and um, and maybe you could build a sexier D to C brand like figs. For construction, so this is the idea. Um, this is the idea. Figs for construction. You know, construction workers have Dude, a lot of different things that they wear. Listen, I know that you don't know who Dolly Parton is, and you're just so disconnected to like normal Amer- Americans. <laughs> it's called Carhartt, you dummy. This is a thing. I've been wearing this for years, and it's awesome. Google Carhartt. You don't know Carhartt. What Carhartt? You've, no. you've never heard that word Carhartt. Never even heard it. Never God, even heard of it. Carhartt. Dude, Carhartt, Dude, you don't know. Obviously, a car- obviously, there's brands that do durable, you know, rugged wear. I'm not no, saying No, Carhartt is that. like, I remember as a kid, like, we used to go to the hardware. This sounds like I'm real redneck, but I'm not that redneck. But you go to the hardware store and you get a coat and you get a Carhartt. Carhartt is like, it's like the thing. It's so like, and it's even like cute now. Like, they've like cutified it. So now, if you're in college and you're in like a country area, the hot girls will wear like Carhartt overalls. And that's like, they're like cute now. They have like Carhartt, Louis Vuitton collabs. <laughs> okay. So when did Carhartt start? Carhartt started in 1889. Is this the company you're talking about? Yes. This company Carhartt, from the 1800s, bro. bro. I'm talking about building Dude, a modern day thing. You're talking about this 1800s it company? It is modern at this point. They've <laughs> they've revolutionized it. Like go to Carhartt Fall Collection. They've got like a whole like cute kid. Like it looks like a fucking, like the kids are wearing Carhartt and very, vans and, and doing like TikTok. Good yeah, for them bro. For, for modernizing. They okay, totally so- changed it. It's like, yeah, Carhartt is like, it's like, it's like cool now. I mean, it all it was, it was like the workers' man so, thing. So and here, I used to wear here's the Missouri. mistake you're making. Here's the mistake you're making. First of all, you're yelling in the mic. That's a mistake for the podcast. Second, <laughs> second of all, uh, the mistake you're making is thinking that because something exists. But that's not how e-commerce works, bro. E-commerce I agree. is fucking I agree. clone on clone crime. It's just, oh, this works great. I'll do it too. Thank you. Take my piece of the pie. And uh, and so this working tells me nothing more than that this is a even better idea for somebody to go start. Look, I agree. I agree. To say, oh, does does this exist? Like that's a dumb – we always get those DMs all the time. What, why doesn't this exist? I'm like, I don't know and it doesn't matter. It probably just, it, does. Yeah. It probably does. It, it has – just do it or don't do it. But whether something does or doesn't exist, it doesn't matter. But I just got to check you for a minute acting like you're like coming up with this, ooh, we should just do figs for construction I'm wear. Saying, like, dude. I'm saying there is an opportunity for somebody to do this. And by the way, I'm looking at their stuff. And they definitely have a lot of the like, like there's like this. I don't even know what you call this thing. This like, you know, this like super yellow neon jacket that's like, yeah. you know, you know, you're not a fireman, but you wear this for some reason. So, so uh, they definitely have a lot of the pieces. But when I was going down the rabbit hole of looking at what, what, what are all the things that basically outdoor workers wear? Whether you're on an, you know, you're in, in a shale uh, fracking, you know, p- uh, field or you're doing construction of homes or, you know, it doesn't really matter which which version of these, but it's like there's a premium to be placed on super rugged, durable shoes, but also mud shoes, but also heavy jackets. There's a towel that goes on your neck. That's a cooling towel. There's like this whole line of stuff. And the reason I think this might be bigger and better than figs is if you look at Carhartt or Duluth, which are a couple of the companies that do this, I think they're both like 600 million plus in annual sales. Duluth, I looked up before this. There are 638 million in annual sales. It's only got a 500 million dollar market cap. So double the revenue of Figs. So and, wait, you know what's Duluth? One tenth of the you... market cap. Duluth Trading Company is another. It's like Carhartt. Um, their D 2 C business was growing 70 percent year over year. Uh, yeah. So it's a. It's obviously like where where the action is versus all their retail retail shops. And so I think you could come in. I think you could build a new brand in this space and get acquired by Duluth, get acquired by Carhartt, these multi-billion-dollar companies, as just another another brand. And you know, there's an existing D2C playbook that's like some combination of 
Facebook and Instagram ads, influencers, blah, 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 like cutesy colors, nice packaging, all that good stuff. And I think you would want to not do so cutesy here for, for the rugged wear. But I think there's an opportunity to cr- uh, create a pretty iconic brand here. I wouldn't be surprised for somebody to do, to do Yeti coolers for this Carhartt brand, right? Like I think there's a Yeti coolers type of brand to be built in this space. Do you remember Land's End? Did you ever shop there as a kid? Like your parents get no. like, you don't remember Is Land's like End? a monument Land's- in San Francisco? Uh, well, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, it is. But it's also like, uh, it's a store. Like, remember East Bay as a kid? Like, East, yeah. everybody, it, it lands in. Sneakers, yeah. So the, it's uh, American made clothing. Basically, you probably know what their boots are. So if you Google lands in and then the word duck, it'll probably, with, it's called the duck boot. You definitely know what that looks like. It's like the traditional, like, snow boot that you wear as okay. a kid. And it's way popular now again. Land's End, I was just is another thing. It's just like Duluth, but yeah, these companies are trading for crazy low. One point five billion dollars in sales, eight hundred million dollar market cap. Yeah, I don't know why their multiples suck so bad, and that just kind of shows me that Figs is Figs's story. The thing I talked about at the beginning, like we are, you know, Starbucks for scrubs. What does that even fucking mean? That means nothing. That's just words. Uh, you know, we're Nike, we're Lululemon, well, we're I mean, Figs, I, we're the next yeah. one. You know, that's that just story. words. Yeah, that's true. It is just words. <laughs> <laughs> that's just words. That's a, that's a good diss to anybody at any time, by the way. Those are just words. <laughs> Immediate shutdown of anybody. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think they're, you know, I don't know if they're overvalued or what, but they're definitely like trading outside of their category. But so. you need to do, if you're going to do this, so construction is interesting. If Land's End is interesting because it was like Midwestern people, but you have to do like a brand and a niche where it feels like us against the world so nurses feel it's predominantly women so they already have that little like segment of like you know we're we're the underdog nurses they probably think that they're overworked underpaid so you got that vibe going and it's like look we're overworked we're underpaid this thing's gonna make us look good and actually feel good that's we that's the least we deserve you know what i mean so so you it's it's been far better you got to go with this angle of this group who feel What's that brand that we talked about? That's the like America gr- grunt grunt style grunt work. What is it called? I don't know what you're talking about. What do you What do you mean? Is Grailed? It no, it's called Grunt Style. So go to gruntstyle.com. I think we talked about them. No, what's that? It's it's a us against the world. Um, you know, proud for the, we are proud of the police. We are proud. Oh of the military. yeah, these guys like kill. We are it. proud it's of like our a- country. We yeah. we don't you know vaccine you know you can stick your vaccine here uh that's the vibe you get when you go to grunt style and you know it's very much a us against them flags flying everywhere using american ip basically to build the brand right like here's a whiskey glass with two cross rifles you know uh you know here, here's a here's a here's a hat that looks like it's been used for for you know 10 years um that's the type of stuff they sell this company crushes i think they do over 100 million in sales this company you know alone so so I definitely think that us versus them is a, it's a turbo charge when it comes to marketing, especially for especially for D to C. Um, all right, can I can we can I tell you about an idea? So, yeah. this one has this is weird how I got to this, but basically I am interested. Like my dream, there's this guy named George Barber. George Barber in the early 1900s, his father started a dairy farm. And eventually, George Barber took it over. Now, George is either dead or in his like 90s. I can't remember if he's dead or not. And he sold his dairy farm uh, based out of uh, Arkansas or Alabama. Barbara, I forget. And he sold it for like five or six hundred million dollars and he crushed it. And with a lot of that money, he opened this thing called Barber, uh, Bar- the Barber Museum. And he created a F1 racetrack in Alabama. And now, um, if you are motor, uh, they do it for motorcycle race races. They do it for uh, F one races, for NASCAR, all types of stuff. You can they people from all over the world go to watch races there. And he, now he has got the largest collection of motorcycles in the world. And the way that he set it up, and is how the way that a lot of these places set up. So, have you ever been in like a small town or or somewhere outside of San Francisco, and you see like a car museum? And it's usually just like one person that owns it. It's just like a rich guy who like sets it up. But they okay, they, let's pretend I have. Yeah, <laughs> you, too American for you. But anyway, they set up a they set it up as nonprofits, and so you can actually go and like see their assets and stuff. And so that interested me. Anyway, I just got really interested because I want to own a fuckload of cars. I want to own like historical memorabilia, and the way that you do it at a ta- tax advantageous way is you create a museum. 
And so I went down this little rabbit hole. Have you heard of this company of like, basically, I've, I went down this rabbit hole of places that you can go to just to see interesting shit. And like, that's all you're doing. You're just sightseeing. And you just leave. Yeah. And you pay a little money. And that just got me interested. Have you heard of Meow Wolf? Meow Wolf. Sounds familiar. Let me, just, let me look it up. What is it? Okay. I put their deck in here. So I came across their deck. It's, it's an old deck. It's from 2017. And what Meow Wolf is, it started in 2008 in Santa Fe. And it started as a, a, a place to explore immersive art. What the hell does that mean? Like that, like that doesn't very, <laughs> who, who the hell knows? That could be anything. And so basically what it is, is they would rent out these massive old warehouses in Santa Fe. And I believe also in Las Vegas. And they would hire these artists who typically don't make any money. And they would say, hey, come and make stuff here at our place. And we're going to create like, a, not quite a museum, but almost like a haunted house meets a museum meets right. Circus Soleil. And right. <laughs> and you pay like fifty dollars, and you just walk through, and it's like an immersive feeling. It's, it's very challenging to explain, but do you see the pictures? Yeah, I'm looking at it. You, I think you described it pretty well. It's like like the haunted house meets kind of like uh, a rave, you know, like some kind of rave meets like a museum. And it this this thing got me interested because I was like, I want I want to own like a warehouse and finance it with this stuff and just. Have, collect cool shit but uh guess how much revenue these guys well guess how big this business is um let's just say 50 million a year so they've raised like i believe 250 million dollars and they projected that just one of their locations will make close to 40 million a year in sales and they're having like over a dozen locations throughout the country is that freaking nuts would you ever have thought that How, how old is this is this like was this started Sir, like in the, like this uh, year? Oh, wait, or the, the 10 year oh, wait. Ago? Oh, oh, wait. Okay. And so they opened one in Las Vegas in 2021, and they already sold 500,000 tickets for it. Then they're opening one in Denver. They're uh, going to Austin. They're going to Los Angeles. It's crazy. Is this? It's just a crazy, crazy, crazy business. And they said that remarkable. their projections you- for the, the their Santa Fe location, uh, or sorry, their Austin pro- projections were 60 million in revenue. 30 million in profit off one location. Right. What would you uh, like? How do they get people to come to these? What, what is it like? What's the what's the marketing to get to sell 500,000 of these tickets? Like, obviously, there's some word of mouth and stuff like that, because it's a pretty remarkable looking thing. But do, do these guys advertise like crazy? Do you like you have their deck? Do you see much about like their growth? Like I put the deck in the I put the grow. Uh, I put the deck in the Zencaster uh, thing, by the way. So you have it. Um, but oh, it's locked. Uh, I think I don't have access. Um, and so, yeah, sorry about that. And so what they do is, um, uh, they, they team up. So they teamed up with Santa Fe, the government of Santa Fe. So the government of Santa Fe was like funneling people to them. If you Google Meow Wolf Santa Fe, they even put together a, um, they even put together a like study, an economic study to show how much Meow Wolf is helping the, the local area. And so they team nice. up with the, with local governments and that helps them like, so like they funnel people in there, but I actually don't know. I don't think they do a significant amount of paid advertising. I'm not seeing it anywhere. Right. Yeah. I think that, uh, I'm, I'm really into this idea. And by the way, I see they have a bunch of Facebook ads on, so I don't know how much they're spending, but they definitely are running a bunch of Facebook ads and they look pretty cool because the exhibits are cool. So I'm pretty into this idea. Um, and I feel like there's a whole bunch of different niches you could go with this that are like hyper, um, have like hyper engagement. And so I think that there's, you know, if you just go city by city and you say, all right, what, what could I do that's a pop up here that would um, be able to consistently draw people? So I think I told you about this once, but there was this, um, what's it called? Two bit circus. Are you familiar with two bit circus? No, what's that? So, so look it up. It's, um, which is like the number two, you know, like TWO, two bit circus. I think this is the name of it. So there's a guy who, um, okay, so the guy who invented Chuck E. Cheese, his name's Nolan, whatever his name is, his son or grandson, I don't know which one, um, Bush, so Bushel, Bushnell or whatever their names are, th- his son or grandson created this thing called two bit circus, right? So, so grandpa maybe or dad creates Chuck E. Cheese. This person created Tubit Circus, and what Tubit Circus was was basically like a traveling pop-up museum like this, but it was all for like interactive, um, like t- kind of like technology. So like imagine like like yeah, if this yeah, is yeah. like kind of like a haunted house vibe. This is like you know you're in the year 2050, 
watch this. Like, move your hand. This laser will move and follow you. Oh, okay, kids, come into this room. Look at this. Like, with one small mirror, you can reflect light and create this, like, crazy thing. Or put on this VR thing and play Dance Dance Revolution, and you'll feel like you're in space dancing or whatever, right? Like, just a whole bunch of high-tech kind of, like, attractions um, that existed. And they would take this from city to city. And the video made it look like dude, I want to take my kids here. This looks like so much fun. And unlike those other ones that have like a fixed location, this would pop up a tent and they would run this thing. And in one weekend, they would have like 60,000 people in the Bay Area come through, um, you know, like in a four day period or whatever. Uh, and then they would like pack up the tent and they would go hit the road. And I thought this is like a genius idea. And the guy who I knew who was working with them, he was kind of like an exec there. He was like, dude, this is amazing. It's an amazing product. He's like, but, uh, you know, the founders have kind of like shiny object syndrome. They, you know, they want to do this. And then like, uh, you know, like whoever, like, you know, Facebook will say, oh, we want to do a, a private exhibit. And they'll be like, cool, we're going to create the most epic thing ever. Or Obama wants to have us for a party. So like, hey, everybody, like forget the like systematized process that we could just grow repeatedly. Like, let's blow everyone's mind with this thing at Burning Man. And like, just let's, let's create something nobody's ever seen. And they would go do that. He's like, dude, it's like so annoying. Like we just can't stay focused. But what, ever since I saw this idea, like, I don't know when this was, seven, eight years ago, I, I first heard this idea, this two-bit circus thing. I just thought it was such a cool, smart idea. And I was, I was shocked. I don't see more of this where this traveling circus where it's a pop-up tent that maybe leverages science or technology because I think parents care to take their kids there. And I think science and technology naturally make for great exhibits and demos and like learning, pl learning plus like visual stimulation. Like if you just think back to like science fair or a science class with a volcano exploding or whatever, like basically that on steroids. And I feel like that's a pretty big thing. But, you know, these are hard businesses to do. I would never go try to do one of these because. Uh, yeah, I they're hard, events. but they seem f I don't like events either. But this is a little bit different than an event. But uh it does seem cool. Speaking of events, let me tell you about something. So I got dinner uh, the other day with Jason, my friend, who runs this thing called Blockworks. And he yeah. had just hosted uh, an event. And, he, and I asked him for, I go, can you tell me numbers so I can talk about it in the pod? Because I think it's interesting. So scroll down to the bottom and you'll see. We're, we're, uh, scroll down past where it says uh, Digital Asset Summit. You see it? Yeah, I see it. Okay, so uh, this is Jason. He's got this company called Blockworks, blockworks.co. It's like the hustle, but for uh, crypto. Um, yep. So two day conference that he just hosted recently. Uh, it did uh, two million in revenue. He said, he told me it did about fifty percent in profit. Eight hundred attendees. Ticket cost one to two thousand dollars, and uh, and then they're doing another event. He has another event coming out in May of so uh, 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 in about a, what's that six months, yep. so eight months, and their goal is eight million in revenue with five thousand attendees. And then most recently, he did a an event. And these are digital, or this is not even a physical conference, right? Uh, the eight million dollar one is, and the digital asset one. Yeah, it's 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 uh, like you go a, there, you see people's faces. Yeah, yeah, it's live. Okay, okay. And then he most recently did one called uh, I think it's called Brenton Woods, and that's for where he basically he had two hundred people come. And or maybe had like a hundred people come, and they were basically large asset managers, and all they did was talked about crypto, and uh, he it did close to a million in revenue, and they only had four sponsors, and it seemed like a pretty sick event. And I was just talking to him, and uh, we were at dinner, and I was just I was just like, just tell me everything that everyone said, like what are the takeaways? <laughs> and I thought a few things. One, I think Jason's only twenty six, so kudos to this fucking guy for yeah, building this business. Uh, and second. What a great hack! I mean, just to like get the get get the intel from the best minds in the world, and like he's smart, but he's just the he's not smart enough to be able to predict the future. Like you know, you could if you sit around with two hundred people who are asset managers for you know the Oregon State Pension Fund, things like that. Right. Um. Pretty amazing that he pulled this off. Yeah. This. Uh, yeah. Shout out to him. This is like well, this is what I would call crushing it. Right. You have this new wave of technology, and you say, all right, I'm gonna go be the hustle or be whoever, I'm going to be the hustle for, for crypto. And then on the event side, it's basically a win, 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 right? You do one of these events, you make money, you get to rub shoulders with all the most interesting people. That's going to open up a whole bunch of other doors that you don't even need to think about ahead of time. And then all of them are going to like think highly of block work, subscribe to it, pay for your premium stuff, like tell their, you know, tell their employees about it, that sort of thing as they go. And in doing so, 
you're promoting the you're evangelizing crypto amongst these like really wealthy people who will start betting on it and it'll grow crypto which will just make your business more popular plus your individual holdings more popular so it's like win win on top of win for a 26 year old i think that's very very impressive um and i think by the way this is a thing anybody can replicate not just in crypto okay this is like let's say i'll call this a home run and it's in crypto but I think there's a lot of people listening to this that would be happy with, you know, half or, or a third or a fourth of the type of success of this. And I think you could achieve that with in any profession. So like take any niche, whether it's like gaming or like in venture capital, right? Like we have rolling funds. Like why isn't somebody just doing this with all the VCs constantly? Like I know Chamath tweeted this out the other day. He goes, hey, uh, yeah, I saw solo, that. solo GPs that are out there. If I organize like a event or retreat for all of us to get to know each other, hey, we're all solo v- GPs, right? But if you just said, new VCs, right? You could be at the bottom. You could be some associate somewhere or not even have a job in venture capital. And you could arrange the kind of like next gen, the next wave VC thing where you invite all the new people to VC to this badass retreat, you know, in wine country or wherever, where it's like, we're all off the grid. We're going to do some cool stuff. There's going to be some speakers. You're glamping, whatever it is. You would be able to make a couple million dollars network with every single person you want to, and you'd kind of have that little mini industry in the palm of your hands. I've seen so people this, do this with digital marketing and every niche. There's this guy, uh, or our friend Nick went to went to this thing the other day, and it's got a great name. It's called Capital Camp. And yes. I believe it's in Columbia, Missouri, where I'm from. And I forget the guy. Oh, Brett. Brett started it, I think. Brett B. Shore, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if he runs it or what the deal is anymore. I think they but- started it, yeah. They started it and it was like, it's hard to explain what the niche is, but I totally know what it is or who would go. But it's basically at this point, we talked last week about the circle of people on Twitter who tweet about finance and tech and real estate. It's kind of this group of people who talk about real estate and sweaty and uh, blue collar businesses on Twitter and they all go to capital camp. And it's like, $10,000, $10,000, yeah, I, I think. I think private equity is like the, the bucket, but then like Nick's not really private equity. He's like self-storage, uh, but like, you know, he'll go to capital camp. So it's, you're right. It's basically private equity is the big umbrella. And then like any kind of sweaty business or um, like cash flowing or, things or, or, or real, estate, real estate business kind of non, you know, non fancy, fancy schmancy tech basically. And it costs 10 grand to go. And Nick went and he said it was totally worth it. And, and the people who I know who go, they say it's totally worth it. And they're going to go back every year. And, it probably made a good. I bet you it made. Uh, it probably made a little bit of profit, but in a fair amount of revenue. Yeah, I'm a, gonna spin up like a mini one of these. Um, I have one that I'm gonna do for Club LTV, which is my like e-commerce, like all store owners who do between one and a hundred million in revenue. Um, basically, I'm gonna do a, a retreat for them, uh, which is just my own excuse to do something fun. Uh, I'm not really gonna try to like make a profit off of it, but as long as they cover all the costs uh, of of hosting a retreat, that'll be great. And so I'm going to do this in the e-commerce niche, but I just feel like you could do this across, like it just in the two two of the camps that we were in, right? Uh, startup investing and uh, and I'm in e-commerce. I think you could do this in either one of those and have, you know, have fun, profits, big build your network, all that stuff. It just takes it just takes hustle, which unfortunately I don't have that much hustle anymore. All my hustle goes to my kids now. There's, there's no, no hustle. Well, left. you will soon, I think. Let me tell you something really quick. I so you're you're you've been angel investing longer than I have. Um, uh, I would not claim that I'm like nearly as good as you or some of our friends, but I, um, two things I did, I did these two things in 2019. Um, one of them just 50 X nice. And one of them just, uh, 12 X amazing on paper and, or, or, or exited already on paper. I actually, I know one of them, the, 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 the 50 X I know it's on paper, the other on, one also paper. on paper. Yeah, That's they're right. both on paper, so they're not real. Stuff but I, I, I feel good because because this whole angel investing thing, you just you spend, you spend, spend, spend you spend, spend yeah. and I'm like, is this ever going to work? I'm just spending all of this money. It's just leaving my bank account. I don't even know if it's there. And when you count it as part of your net worth, like I, I pretty much don't. I'm like, oh, this sucks. What's gonna happen? And right. we'll see like, if it starts actually hatching, those eggs start hatching. Okay, so let me tell you, that I have something related to this. So I texted a friend who I won't say their name, um, but they're an, they an investor. They've been doing this much longer than me. Angel investing, seed investing, that sort of thing. VC, personally, all, they've done it all. Do I know them? I don't think so. Okay. And, um, and so they, 
they've done very, very well. Bunch of eggs, a bunch of winners that are like public companies that we know about, which is like, you know, the, that's the, that's like as high, as high as it goes basically. And so multiple winners like that. So I texted him. I said, I said, Hey, uh, I got to ask you a question. I said, feel free to just brush this off if you don't want to tell me, but, uh, and I'm not asking to be nosy. I'm asking because I'm trying to weigh out my options here. And I said, you know, in terms of investing, you've basically done as good as anyone, as good as I could hope to do, right? Like I would say you have done extremely well. It's kind of like best case scenario type of outcome. And what does that mean personally in terms of what you end up making? I said, here's what my guess, here's what my guess is. Tell me if I'm, if I'm on point or if I'm off. And I basically said, I well, think can you, this- can you, can, can you give all the numbers because the person's anonymous? Yeah, I'm going to say the number. So I said, I think that you probably will make 15 to $30 million over a kind of 10 to 15 year period of investing. So it takes probably, probably you don't see any of it till 10 plus years, but between 10 and 20 years, you're going to make, I don't know, 20 to $30 million. And that's a, that payday at the end of the day. And I think along the way, you're making half a million bucks, cushy, kind of like off the management fees or salary. I said, is that about oh, right? Oh, wait, so this person has a fund. They have done many things. So they've invested personally as an angel. They've been a VC at a big fund. They now, I think, kind of like are a solo GP, maybe have their own fund. Maybe it's personal. Got I can't it. really, I don't okay. really know. I don't know all the details, but they've done both. I said, either way, along the way, yeah, they're not, it's not, I'm not saying from their personal money. They've had other people's money, right? OPM, they've always been using OPM, or they've definitely been using OPM for a lot of it. Right. Maybe some of it was angel money, but now it's a lot of OPM. So I said, all right, um, am I right? Uh, so first, like, let me let me ask you to guess. Do you think they said that's right, that's low or that's high? OK, so 10 years they've been doing it. Let's call it 15 years. They've been doing it for 50, 15 years and they've been using other people's money. For most of it. Yeah. How much money did they invest? Can't tell you. Over or under 100. Um, let's say they, they're, they're, they're a seed investor. They're early, they're early stage. Okay, investor. I understand. I would so guess they're they writing made... checks that might be like as low as a hundred K and maybe high as 500 K or a And it was their full, a full-time job for 10 years. Yeah. This is what they do. My guess is way above 15. That I'm low. I, I my guess was low. I would guess like 40 or 50. Yeah, so you're, you're right that my guess was low. So what they said was they go, yeah, it's, it should be much more than that, but it's hard to say because a lot of it's still illiquid. They go, uh, they go, it should look more like 150 to 200 million. No when way. It's all said and done. Um, yeah, and, and, they, and this person's like the, the best. not a, they're not a boaster, but they are one of the best of the best. Meaning their portfolio, you could stack up against pretty much anybody. Like obviously, if you hit one, like you know. I was, you know, the lead investor in Google. Okay, yeah, you're going to have like the outside return. But I'm saying this person has multiple, like, you know, almost, I don't know, more than five, somewhere, somewhere around 10, like, known big winners. And so I'm like, okay, cool. But, you know, you don't know what round, how much they invested, like, in each of those, right? So, so, look, at, so uh, look at the message. Is that the person? No, that's not the person. So, um, so, so basically, I was like, whoa, that, okay, that's a lot more. But the, and had um, they made money along the way other than their management fee or their salary? Uh, well, just like, you know, the exits as they, as they come through, as they do trickle in. Yeah. So like, you know, first five years, not much. Next five years, some. Next five years, a whole bunch. But you're recycling and you're reinvesting. So, you know, you always have kind of a new batch of companies that you're waiting. You know, you want these things to age 10 years for you to go get a big win out of them. Um, you always have a new vintage, right? What I did 2020, I want to, I want to go uncork that bottle in 2030 and see how it tastes. Oh my God. Sorry. Um, is your ringtone a, is your ringtone a duck? Yeah. It's fucked up. <laughs> Country shit, dude. That's what I like the hunting duck call <laughs> used to attract animals. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just liked it. I just wanted to be a duck. I just like the, <laughs> wah, wah. I just like that noise. Um, okay, so, so, the, so, so wait, so this person, but are they investing their own I'm money pretty now? Stunned. So, so what I told him, I go, I go, wow. So that's basically like you started, you're like a founder of a billion dollar company. If you're going to net a hundred million to $200 million, uh, at the end of this, like, kind of like this journey, this career, I said, you know, it sounds like it happened and a dude, little bit slower. 
it's but you way make the slower same amount of money and way easier, way less it's stress. It's way easier. It's way easier. Yeah. Like way easier. Not even close. Yeah, exactly. And what and, did they say? Um, they were like, I mean, they were like, tr- they're so humble that they were kind of like trying to deflect. They were like, well, you know, tell me how you're thinking about it so I can help you here, right? Because they're like, you know, what are you asking me all this shit for? And like, you know, I don't enough about me. Yeah, I've done well, but like, w- let me help you if you're trying to get some help out of this. And I'll, all I really wanted to know was like, what's the Is size of the it? prize if you knock this out of the park? And like, what's the real, what's the real nuts? Of, like, what really comes through at the end of the day? Like, for somebody who's, because, you know, anytime you go into something, there's like, you know, you could, I can go read about real estate. I'm not a big real estate investor. I can go read about real estate. I could talk, oh, yeah, you're going to make this much gross, this much net. You've got to cap rate, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, then you talk to somebody who's been doing it for 25 years. They're like, yeah, but like, you're, you know, all these hidden costs you're not accounting for, all this extra heartache you're not accounting for, all this extra stress. And then, you know, one of the four buildings, you know, burns up in a fire and you have to account for that loss. So there's so always the what, reality for What was your takeaway, though? Like, what did you, t- t- what did he, what did you, what I wasn't your, looking. I, I wasn't like trying to make a decision on anything. I was just your, thinking. Where's your head at, though? My head is basically like surprised, frankly, that 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 it can be that big. Um, and again, this person's not a boaster. I'm pulling this information out. I think they were just doing me a favor of being honest about what they think this nets in the end. And I was like, wow. The reality, though, is, do I believe I can have the same hit rate as them? No. Uh, like. I think they have had like an they have extreme skill and extreme luck. And so it's like, okay, and they do this full time, right? So it's like, I'm not planning for that, but I like knowing what what winning looks like today. Or what does the top top range of winning look like? Uh, so I was pretty impressed by that. So that was kind of my my takeaway or something, you know, something I learned kind of from I don't, I don't remember what you were talking about before this. You're talking about your 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 multiples. And so yeah, it's pretty pretty impressive. But I would say, you know, that that's on a large amount of invested capital. I should also say that you know, it's it's much more capital than I'm investing because they've done it for longer and they write bigger checks. Yeah, it's way more boring, but it's definitely way easier. And that's the show, right? Yeah. All right, we're out of here.